This is Ann Broughton, and I am uh, an associate professor of practice at North Dakota State University. I'm the curator of the Emily Reynolds Historic Costume Collection, and today I'm going to be presenting a program called Advocating for the Votes for Women, Kate Selby Wilder and North Dakota Women's Clubs at Work. I first became aware of Kate Selby Wilder when her family donated a gift of clothing items that she wore, and the gift included a message, a note, that told that she was the first city commissioner who was a woman elected to Fargo City Commission in 1919, and that she was the first woman to hold statewide, um, hold a city office um, in North Dakota after the um, women received limited suffrage. And then she also served as the first police commissioner it's thought to be in the United States. With the lingerie dress, there are a number of items that were given, but I'm focusing here in this presentation on the lingerie dress, um, in part because it was used so widely in warm weather campaigns in the state of North Dakota. And, um, and so women dressed to, to impress uh, for the campaign. And, um, and so with, with um, um, the lingerie dress, it was a very beautiful and very feminine style. You can see in this picture of the Botano County Fair, where, where the women and, picture, women and children are pictured, that many of them are wearing lightweight fabric lingerie-type dresses. It might be blouses and skirts, jackets and blouses, or perhaps full dresses in white or light colors. Uh, they um, are, are members of both the Votes for Women's League as well as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And at the Botano County State Fair, they are advertising and, and um, offering a restroom um, that was safe for women and children to use. So with the white lingerie dress, this is a, a, a fashionable style of dress for the summer. It's made out of very thin batiste or lightweight cotton fabric combined with strips and bands of laces. And uh, it was a fashionable style from about 1890s until the late 1910s. And so Kate Selby Wilder has had this dress in her wardrobe. With the picture on the right, you can see that white was a, a color that, that women suffragists wore during the parades um, promoting suffrage, women's suffrage. And you can see them, them marching in a very orderly um, formation, uh, like, an, like an army. And so this is a way that, that they showed that they were um, feminine uh, by the, their dress, but yet could also be full citizens of the United States that had the right to vote. In 1848, the first women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. And so this convention came up with a, a, a long laundry list of issues that needed to be addressed um, you know, where uh, it was just unfair to women, they felt. Uh, it included suffrage, property rights, divorce laws, custody of children, temperance, slavery, and the abolition of slavery, and dress reform. And so suffrage was one of the many things that were talked about. Some of these things are state issues and were decided by states, including property rights and divorce law, child custody rights. Some of them were decided by states and federal, so temperance, it was a state's issue as well as, as federal. Abolition of slavery, suffrage was state and federal um, until finally the, the amendment to the Constitution occurred. Dress reform was individual. And so this was a time where, if you look in the center image, you see the woman in a very tightly fitted bodice with a great big huge skirt. And so her waist was constricted and her skirt was so wide that it could catch on fire without her knowing it and would uh, pick up filth from the streets and bring them into her home. And so uh, dress reform garment that was, was um, advocated, we now know as the bloomer. It was ca it called at that time the, um, uh, the tr Turkish trouser. And we can see how um, kids and people um, didn't have a lot of respect for it in England, where this illustration from Punch magazine came from. Women's suffrage gained attention after 60 plus years in 1911. It was a reaction to all the ills and prevails that came along with industrialization. So the society was, was fractured when people moved from the farms into the cities. Um, it, um, it changed the roles of women versus men. 
Men were the, generally the ones that went into work and brought money into the family. Women were in charge of the homes, and they uh, uh, began to organize and, and create their own organizations as they had more leisure time and as commercialism entered into the home, bringing tainted food or um, offering water that was not fit for human consumption um, into their, their homes um, and families. But one of the things that, that um, really um, gained people's attention, forced people's attention, was the actions of militant British suffragists um, in um, Britain. And so they, they did a number of different things that gained attention. One of them was, was um, to, to disrupt parliament, um, shouting votes for women, and, um, and other uh, uh, complaints that they had until they were dragged out and put in jail. They also were jailed for breaking windows or blowing up post boxes. But when they were in jail, they would undergo hunger strikes because they wanted to show that without the vote, they did not consent to be governed. And that with the vote, they would be considered full citizens and be able to participate in enacting laws that they would have to follow. And, and so that argument you know, was, was put forth in the newspapers and magazines of the day and talked about by many different people and you know, gained some credence. Another thing that happened um, you know, in the early teens was the rise of the labor movement and uh, the women's labor movement especially um, made people realize that there was some inequity between what men were paid and what women were paid and, um, and, and so brought that into the public eye. With industrialization, it did change family life. And so there were two spheres. There was the men's sphere that was public and women's sphere that was private. So men, their place was in works and politics, and uh, there were bars that were for men only. Um, and so they were out in the public eye. Women could go out if, a, if um, accompanied by men um, or if they went to women-only activities. And so women developed um, organizations which allowed them to socialize with others um, you know, during time when the men were at work, and it allowed them to kind of figure out that together they could make a difference in um, life and, and what their families had to experience. This illustration that's included with the slide shows an anti-suffragist um, drawing that, that depicts the fear of role reverse, reversal, where men suddenly if women had the vote, would be in the home in charge of all the domestic duties, and women would be in the public eye um, at work and working in, in politics. And so you know, it was one of the things that, that um, they did to frighten people. With women's clubs, they were designed to extend the home. And so with the tainted foods and impure water, impure milk, food that was ground and, and filled not only with meat but also sawdust. Women didn't like that. They wanted to have pure food, and so they organized in different ways to get things done. First of all, they organized ladies' societies in, that were part of their churches, ladies' aid societies. And so um, that, that was okay because women were in charge of educating the children in, in, um, in Christian, in Christian um, teachings but also getting their morals um, set straight and, and creating adults out of their children that were good contributing cit citizens in society. The WCTU developed. It was a, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, so it was Christian women who were middle class and Protestant. And they, their focus was trying to end um, you know, overconsumption of alcohol, so being temperate in the consumption of alcohol. Um, and, and they um, were a society that, that developed during this time. The National Federation of Women's Club, Clubs was a um, organized local and state study clubs that were literary um, study clubs or organized around another um, occupation or, or adv avocation. And that was a very important society for women from the upper crust of society. So not middle class, but upper class women were primarily in charge of the Federation of Women's Club. But yet the WCTU was a member of the Federation of Women's Club, and so there were middle-class women involved with it. Then there also were women's auxiliaries of men's clubs at the time. So Eastern Star is a Masonic organization for women, and so it's an offshoot of the Masons that are men. 
The WCTU was a very important club, and part of this was due to the, the, um, uh, the forward thinking of President Francis Willard, who served from 1879 to 1898. She expanded the focus of, of the WCTU beyond temperance to social reform. If you recall that list of issues brought up in 1848, you know, they were still a problem in, uh, in, in the 1879s and 1880s and 90s when Frances Willard became president. And so um, she thought that it would be a good idea for women to try to address these ills. In 1888, WCTU created a franchise department, and, and they worked with Susan B. Anthony to endorse suffrage. And so that was something that people didn't really agree with, of the total membership didn't agree with. Many did, but many didn't. And, but Willard was a genius in that she allowed members to address local needs and campaign for suffrage if they were supportive of it, it but you know, to do what was, was needed locally. And the WCTU developed leadership skills of many of the women that went on to advocate um, as um, leaders in the women's um, uh, suffrage campaign. And so uh, leadership and advocacy skills were developed by participation in the WCTU. There were initiatives and, and departments within the WCTU that, that were developed around philosophical um, points of view. So one of them was home protection. And within that entity, there, there was the franchise department, which was uh, the department that um, was organized to allow women to vote and um, to get women the vote. And so they argued that the vote for women would allow women to truly protect their families and not be legally classified with children and the feeble-minded. Social purity was a, uh, uh, an initiative that, that uh, focused on many of the ills that still exist within society. So they, they um, had different programs and uh, educational opportunities to end domestic violence, to end the double standard associated with sexuality, and to end the exploitation of women and children. One of the ways that they, they manifested this social purity initiative in North Dakota was through life-saving stations at train stations. So the um, WCTU in Fargo would look at the schedules of trains and note when passenger trains were due in. They would have a member stand on the platform looking for women um, who were traveling alone or with children, and engage them in conversation if they looked like they needed help. And they would suggest safe places for lodging. They uh, would direct them to the WCTU clubhouse, which was located near the Northern Pacific Railroad Station. That's on Main Avenue near Robert Street. And, um, and um, invite them in for social activities as they became settled in the community. Another way that they manifested the social purity initiative was with support and management of the Florence Crittenden home. The third thing listed here is the do every, everything policy. And so this was the, an encouragement for women who were WCTU members to do everything they could all the time and to work on issues of concern regardless whether they related to temperance and to do them um, with as much uh, dedication as they could possibly muster. The WCTU's argument was that women's nature is morally superior than the nature of men. And so this um, you know, it, um, is something that was accepted at the time. And so it, was, it championed women's moral authority to protect the home and family. And in this yellow um, poster that's shown on the right-hand side of the screen is a, a, a poster from the 1914 referendum for giving women the vote. And you can see that women's interests include the home, children, morals, and business. And um, at the bottom it says that they may help secure laws which will protect these interests and officials who will enforce the laws. And so the WCTU focused on that um, during that, that state referendum in 1914. And you know, nationally, they had a quarter of a million members you know, prior to this election. 
And so it was a big organization that had a lot of power. And you know, it was supported by the way that people were thinking at this particular time. Kate Selby Wilder was a very active member of the WCTU. She was born in Pennsylvania in 1876, moved as a child to Caledonia, North Dakota by Hillsborough. When their, her father's claim was proven up, they moved to Grand Forks, and she was educated in Grand Forks, graduated valedictorian from Grand Forks High School. Yeah, and she, she was married in 1901 to Frank Wilder. They moved during that year to Fargo, North Dakota, and she was an active member of the WCTU um, in Grand Forks as well as in Fargo. In 1906, she became president of the Young Women's Club, so a club for, for younger women, married or not, um, from 1906 to 1908. Then she became president of the Fargo Union in 1909, which was an umbrella organization of the five clubs in the Fargo area. And there were three that were English-speaking Anglo-Saxon clubs, and there were two that were Scandinavian, uh, Norwegian-speaking clubs. And one of her, her, her um, duties was to try to, to get the, the uh, different groups to coordinate activities, but also she worked to get Scandinavian women involved in the leadership of, of the district and, and state level of the WCTU. She also became superintendent of the state of North Dakota's press work for the WCTU in that year, 1909. And 1915, she was state speaker. And she served in other capacities of the WCTU until her death in the 1940s. She was also an active member of the Fortnightly Club, which was part of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. And this was an important uh, um, club for her. Um, she was involved with women that were, you know, a little bit uh, more uh, situated in Fargo uh, society, a little higher on the economic scale. Um, Clara Darrow, um, she was the wife of a doctor. Christine Pollock, the wife of a judge. Helen DeLondresi, her husband owned the largest department store in North Dakota. Helen Sudro was the wife of a professor of um, uh, chemistry and pharmacy at NDSU. Beulah Amidon was the wife of a judge. And so this club focused on sociology, which was a, an emerging discipline, trying to understand what was happening um, to society at the time as industrialization worked its way through and changed the way that, that people organized themselves um, culturally, politically, and economically. All of these members were charter members of the North Dakota Votes for Women's League. And so the Fortnightly Club served as a nexus for women's suffrage in North Dakota. And so you can see the beautiful handwriting of Kate Selby Wilder um, writing down the offices that the various people were involved in um, in the Votes for Women's League organization in 19, February of 1912. 1912 was also an important year for suffrage because it was a pre presidential election year. This was the first time that a pres presidential candidate included suffrage on his platform. That candidate was Theodore Roosevelt. Um, who was nominated to be candidate for the Progressive Party, you know his the or the Bull Moose Party, and so he was Progressive Party presidential candidate. He ran against William Ho Howard Taft on the platform party. Woodrow Wilson was a Democratic candidate, and Eugene Debs was running on a socialistic ticket. And um, Roosevelt and Taft split the vote, uh, and Woodrow Wilson became president. Wilder was active in the Progressive Party, and she served in 1912 as the chairperson of women. And one of her duties was hosting women speakers of uh, note, including Jane Addams, who was a person that, that seconded Theodore Roosevelt's nomination as president of the Progressive Party. She was also head resident of the Hull House Settlement in Chicago, and the settlement house movement was, was um, something that, that allowed impoverished immigrants to um, have a place to socialize, to pick up education, perhaps English language skills or other skills, as well as helping them provide a place to live. Um, Wilder also served as the spokesperson for progressive party candidates and you know, traveled um, to speak on behalf of the pro 
Progressive Party. The Oak Times on February 9th talks about Suffrage Sunday. And so um, the paper was actually printed and issued February 6th of 1913. So Suffrage Sunday was something that the Votes for Women's League promoted. And the president of that group, Clara Darrow, uh, encouraged people uh, to host a Suffrage Sunday. On that day, every minister and priest of every creed and, de and denomination is urged to speak for suffrage from the pulpit and to lay it upon his congregation as an act of human justice to secure the passage of the suffrage bill endorsed by uh, Votes for Women's League now before the legislature at Bismarck. Our state must be made cleaner, safer, a better place for the growth of homes, schools, churches, all institutions that make for righteousness. This will be none, done none too quickly, even if we all work together with every weapon we can command. The ballot in the hands of women is one unused tool within our reach. Signed by Beulah Amadon. The referendum was something that the uh, that would put people and women supportive of this issue into action. The vote was November in four, 1914, and from when the the uh, issue passed, the bill passed in 19 excuse me 1913 April to November of 1914, Wilder was in the field campaigning, and she um, was sponsored by the WCTU and the Votes for L Women's League to bring candidates and speakers. Uh, you know, to various parts of the state to uh, to um, speak on behalf and uh, generate interest. They made use of a nonpartisan league where they contacted every candidate that was running and to find out if they were supportive of women's suffrage. If the candidate was supportive, the North, North Dakota Votes for Women's League promoted that candidate. They also made use of automobiles to um, um, generate interest in their cause. And so in the picture that's shown, um, it's uh, K uh, Clara Darrow driving a car with the banner Votes for Women's League draped over the windshield and on the side. And in the back are, are two speakers that are from, the, uh, uh, from different organizations in Minnesota. You can see the one standing addressing the crowd. And, uh, and so they would drive up to an area. They would stand up in the back seat. People would gather around, not necessarily because the women were of interest, but the car was of interest because they were considered a novelty. There weren't many of them around. And the women would, would give their stump speech. They would answer any questions and engage the audience. And when the interest had, had in the car and then the point of view that they were espousing were, was done, uh, they would drive to the next, uh, uh, the next event or drive home. And so this was very effective. This nonpartisan approach and the use of automobiles were also used by the nonpartisan league in the, you know, starting in 1915 when they um, emerged and, and began to organize in the state of North Dakota. And so it's interesting, you know, they, they never attributed their use of automobiles or their nonpartisan approach to the, uh, the um, suffrage movement, you know, but it, it's there. They, the women did it before uh, the nonpartisan league did. In November of 1913, on the 3rd, the people of North Dakota voted, and the referendum failed. South Dakota and Montana also had, had similar suffrage bills in front of the people, that, uh, referendums in front of the people, but only Montana's was ratified. So in 1914, Montana uh, and their women were, received the right to vote. There was a strange clause put into the Constitution relating to women's suffrage, you know, it wasn't granted in 1889, but this was inserted that if the majority of all voting at the election, um, um, uh, okay, let me start over. If if um, if a, a question for women's suffrage came before the, uh, the the people, a majority of all those voting at the election was needed. So there were in this slide it shows that there were four thousand or forty thousand two hundred nine votes for suffrage. There were. 49,348 votes counted against, against suffrage, but this included no votes as well as votes that on this issue that were not marked. As when they total this up, it should equal it equals 89,587 votes counted. But 
the total votes for candidates for this election was only 89,307. So there were fewer votes um, for candidates than total votes counted. And so people were very upset ab about this. But it was in the Constitution, and, and precinct workers were not um, trained in how to, how to save ballots, and so many of them threw ballots away, so there was not a way for, to recount the vote. And so this um, uh, referendum failed. And so uh, uh, it was disappointing to uh, people uh, pro-suffrage, but it is uh, what happened in 1914. The votes for the Women's League continued, as well as the WCTU continued. And with their efforts, they proceeded on with the work that, that their societies did. And um, uh, with the WCTU, Kate Selby Wilder worked in managing institutes um, as president of the 15th district of the, the WCTU in the state of North Dakota. And she organized institutes um, relating to prohibition. To, uh, you know, there was a proclamation that was read that um, was, was in favor of nationwide prohibition and with the discussion that followed. And so this was an important aspect that ran alongside suffrage at this time. And the WCTU was directly involved, as well as men's societies um, that were pro-temperance. In 1917, the Nonpartisan League, the legislative session, there was enough support to get limited women's suffrage granted in North Dakota. And this is a picture of Governor Fraser signing the women's suffrage bill into law that granted limited suffrage for any office not listed in the state or federal constitution. And um, uh, uh, concurrently with this, World War I was going on and world and the United States entered World War One, April sixth, nineteen seventeen. Um, during this time, there was an organization of pro suffrage National Women's um, League that was was um, or National Women's Party that would station silent sentinels to picket the White House. And so, between nineteen seventeen and nineteen nineteen, once the war had been declared against Germany. President Wilson's words were put on banners to show how uh, he was not in favor of, 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 nation, of national suffrage, federal suffrage. And uh, so we see a picture of, of women holding a banner saying, Mr. President, you say liberty is a fundamental demand of the human spirit. And then behind that, a woman is carrying a banner that says, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And so these... Um, phrases were used um, just to, uh, you know, to show that women were, were aware of what President Wilson was saying that ran contrary to really what he was doing at home in not supporting a federal um, amendment granting women's suffrage. He was in favor of a state-by-state -state approach. A North Dakota uh, woman, Miss Beulah Amidon, who is the daughter of Judge Amidon, and then Beulah Amidon, the woman who was the press secretary uh, for the, the Suffrage Sunday uh, campaign. Um, their daughter was educated in an Ivy League school and then served as press secretary for the National Women's Party in Washington, D.C. She was a silent sentinel, and she was arrested and jailed for picketing August 15, 1917. And so she would, would tell about what she was experiencing or what she experienced and kept... North Dakotans abreast, and so they were very concerned what was happening to, to their daughter, and you know, and so this this um, sympathy was conveyed not only in the organizations like the WCTU or the the Votes for Women's League, but also throughout the papers um, of the state of North Dakota. In World War One, women aided the war effort in many ways. Women served over in Europe um, as nurses, as Red Cross ambulance drivers, and and campaign operator, canteen operators. But on the home front, they they served in other ways as well, working in industries where not enough men were available. But also with the Liberty Loan campaign, which was uh, a war bond issue. There were four of them that were issued between 1917 and 1918. 
Kate Selby Wilder was the chief of Women's Bureau of Speakers for North Dakota for each of these campaigns. They would uh, gain uh, the podium for a minute or so before uh, uh, film or before any kind of live show or presentation and encourage people to buy war bonds. The, the illustration to the right is from the Third Liberty Lo Loan Campaign um, and features the Boy Scouts of America as future soldiers that they are being prepared, so you need to support them by buying war bonds. The Red Cross was involved uh, in uh, providing clothing for soldiers. One of the things that, that people were asked to do is knit hats and gloves and vest, vests. And so these knitted garments were then brought to a central place and then sent to the front for soldiers to wear. They also instructed people with detailed instructions how to prepare bandages that were sanitary and rolled in a, in a prescribed way that were used um, by the doctors on the front to uh, treat wounded soldiers. The Liberty Garden and food conservation um, educational efforts were also promoted by women's networks, including the WCTU and uh, um, the uh, Federation of Women's Clubs and the women that, that were members of them. With limited suffrage allowed in North Dakota, Kate Selby Wilder was elected to Fargo on April 1st, 1919, and this article appeared in the Fargo Forum April 2nd, 1919. So she will help govern Fargo. She was elected to the Fargo City Commission and was the first North Dakota woman to be elected to a city office. And um, she served the, as a police uh, commissioner for two years, helping to modernize and better equip the forest. Um, in 1921, when there was another city election, her term continued on, but she was given the, uh, the public health portfolio and served in that capacity two years. And um, she served as a commissioner two years, or excuse me, four years, one four-year term, and then ran but was not reelected. She was very supportive of, of um, uh, building an electrical generated power plant for the city of Fargo. And this was supported by trade unions. And, um, and so that helped to get her into office in 1919. And it was built. Women's club networks in North Dakota and nationwide built support for prohibition, prohibition and for women's suffrage. They were responsible for helping to gain support for two amendments to the United States Constitution. The first one is the 18th Amendment for nationwide prohibition. That was proposed by, Congre by Congress December 18, 1917, and sent to states to ratify, which was done in January of 1916, 19, or January 16, 1919. The 19th Amendment, allowing women's suffrage, was proposed by Congress June 4, 1919, but it was not ratified until August 18, 1920. The anniversary is celebrated August 26, because that is when it was certified and became law. August 26, 1920. And so we're, we're um, celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. And so there are some things that are happening within North Dakota to celebrate the centennial of women's suffrage. Um, one of the things that, that people are doing as they, they talk on social media about um, events or, or points of view is they're using a hashtag pound 19th at 100 to tie it and you know allow people to search for um, things relating to the centennial of women's suffrage. Kathy Codell King of the University of North Dakota has written a play about North Dakota women's suffrage. Um, it's a historically based drama, and it's available to theater groups to perform on their own, or she has a troupe of actors that will come out and do professional readings um, um, to your organization if you would like to hire them. There's also a special newspaper edition on no women's suffrage that's coming out um, statewide in North Dakota, August in 2020. And then uh, last year, a book called Equality at, at the Ballot Box was released. Um, it's called, its subtitle is Votes for Women on the Northern Great Plains, and it includes the um, uh, essays that look at North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming suffrage activities. It was edited by Lorianne Lallum and Molly P. Rosam. And it was published by the North Dakota Historical Society Press. 
Um, I have the honor of having two essays in there, one that, that talks about the white dresses that women wore on the suffrage campaign, um, and then another talks about Kate Selby Wilder and gives more detailed information about that. I appreciate your interest. I have two additional slides that show the credits of um, um, that I use for the illustrations that were used as well as resources. And so this is the illustration list as well as the referent list. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate you um, taking part in your interest in this, this um, event.